and I keep rolling up. We blow it down, we blowing up. Hot air in me, we going up. Still is no feet. First, going Mick, thank you for coming. No problem. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to start from the beginning. What was it like growing up in Huntsville, Alabama for the early portion of your life? What was it like? Um, I was raised very uh, Seven Day Adventist, um, it's a Christian religion. Um, Oakwood University is a huge school for people who are Seven Day Adventist. Mm -hmm. Um, my father worked there, so I was always around that campus, even since I was like five years old. Um, that's where I spent most of my time in Huntsville. My dad was there, my mom and my father, by the, at that time, I'm like seven, my mom and my father are separated. I mean, I grew up there originally, but once my mom and my father separated, my mom, mother went to Florida, my dad was in Huntsville. And that's the time that I really remember, like, affecting my life. I used to skateboard around the campus and, you know, it wasn't really much to do in Huntsville. So yeah. being on the campus was like exciting, you know, um, when we weren't in school and shit. So yeah. I used to be around Oakwood campus most of the time. That to me, that is my childhood in Huntsville. You know, there wasn't really much else to do. I was either in the gym, tennis court or at the crib. For, yeah. We were in the gym and the tennis court, we were on Oakwood campus. So yeah. that's really what my life was. It was hot, it was slow. Mm. <laughs> um, but it wasn't too much to get into, mm. I, I left. I was when I was nine years old, so. And then, wait, so you were on the campus, like, because your dad worked there growing up. Did you attend that university later? Yeah, yeah, okay. that's how, where I ended up. Going. How was your experience when you were attending the university? Uh, I mean, I wasn't really, I wasn't someone in school who was super worried about school. Yeah. I was just worried about, like, popularity and, mm -hmm. like, mixing with people and, like, doing, kicking it and, like, you know, just being myself you know, taking advantage of all the things that weren't education at college. You know, that's what I was doing. Um, yeah. That's where my focus was. So it was fun. I met a lot of people, uh, made a lot of relationships with people that I still, you know, call on today as, as an artist. There's a lot of, lot, a lot, a lot of great uh, artists, music, singers, uh, instrumentalists at Oakwood. Yeah. It's definitely a music hub. My band at, for the last 10 years, even though it has, um, I think like, included a total of like 12 people all together over the years. Um, I get all those people from Oakwood Connections just mm. because there's so many talented musicians and singers at Oakwood. So um, shout out Oakwood University, you know. Um, but as far as your question, it was it was college. Yeah, 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 <laughs> It was college for yeah. sure, yeah. So I know you ended up moving to Chicago at a certain point when you were young. Um, how was that transition from like Huntsville to Chicago? Uh, it was crazy for me. It was a culture shock for sure. Um, I never been in a big city like this. Uh, I was didn't know I was country. I didn't know I was southern. You feel me? Yeah. Like in my in my voice, in the way that I spoke, in the way that I, I didn't have no concept of that, right? So when I came up here and started going to school, mm. being like, "Oh, you sound funny. Oh, you dress funny. Oh, mm. you act funny." You know, it was a very quick assimilation because I didn't want to keep being the uh, the butt of jokes or like yeah. getting pointed at or anything like that. So. I think maybe like six months into going to school up here, I was full. I was talking and walking and acting like I've been here my whole life. Mm. <laughs> um, so uh, my mom, 14 years old, super encouraged me to like get on a train and explore mm -hmm. the city. So I was doing that a lot. Um, I would say by the time I was 15, I, five years in Chicago, I felt like I was from Chicago. So yeah. I think just the pe I moved to 73rd and Loomis first. And then we were on 91st and Langley shortly after that. So I think just a lot of the, the neighborhoods I was in and the people I was around um, definitely made me feel welcome. Um, I went to school at Hirsch on 79th Street. That's not a place where I felt welcome, but you know, you just, you learn. You learn how to move, you learn how to act, you learn how to be, you learn what's okay, what's not okay. You know, um, as a kid, you don't even think about it too much. Yeah, You just, are trying to survive and exist and progress in whatever space that you're in. So yeah. uh, it wasn't so much conscious thought to what I was doing for real, for real. I was just trying to get in where I fit in. Um, yeah. And I, I didn't think it took me that long to do so. Can you explain what is going on in this photo? Is that Tumblr? It's a, I think it was Mick and Matt WordPress .com. Oh, It was WordPress. Okay. Yeah. I, I was looking for my old Tumblrs mm. yesterday and I can't remember the names. Damn. 
find Boom. it. Boom. Looks like I was on WordPress. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the in the photo or the video? Yeah, just in, tell me about the website. Tell well, me about these episodes. Mick and Matt is some shit that I was doing in college. My, Matt's one of my best friends, Matthew Gross. And um, we was early, man. We didn't we, we had our own little show. We used to do a mm-hmm. campus show called Mick and Matt. We would wrap up the week mm-hmm. of like current events in the world and like things that happened on campus. Mm-hmm. Usually trying to make jokes out of it, yeah. uh, making it funny. Um, we had three seasons. I think we had like twelve episodes in each season. The last season had nineteen episodes. Um, I actually, the last show of Making Matt was a documentary, like a twenty-minute documentary about love, mm. and I used clips from that in "Spread Love" the song on my album. So, uh, yeah, while I was in school, Making Matt was a big deal for us. Cause it was like a show that we were running. Yeah. Um, on that page is a clip of me at a competition that I also entered while I was at Oakwood called Who Got Bars. Yep. It, was a, it was a rap competition. They let you use written six teams, mm-hmm. uh, and you go against other people in the competition. I ended up coming in second mm-hmm. in the competition, but uh, like I said, those are just two examples. Mick and Matt, uh, who got bars? It's like I was doing everything in college but yeah. work. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, so that's what that was yeah. for sure. Yeah, ahead yeah. of its time in 2010 to to get off 45 ish episodes. Like, and that's I, I think about that all the time. Like, man, we did it on Facebook. We should have yeah. been on YouTube. Like, if we did it on YouTube, yeah. we could have like snowballed it into easier something. Easier to say like, now, man. Facebook easier to say time, now. Like, yeah, at the time, Facebook was jumping. Yeah, so, yeah. That's um, funny. Um, so. You were a part of a very pivotal and special time in Chicago's music scene in the early 2010s. And I'm curious to know, what was it like for you to kind of be a part of that renaissance? And now looking back, like to see how all you guys have progressed in your lives and career, like what does that time period mean to you? It was just the time period to me. It's special, you know, but it's Mm -hmm. just, I don't think, uh, it's not something you're conscious of when you're doing it, you're just doing it. You know, I think it's not, I didn't choose to be around these people Mm -hmm in a sense of like, these are just the people I gravitated towards. You know what I'm saying? Because they were dope, um, because we were like-minded, because if we weren't, we found things in each other that we wanted to like learn about and and mold to ourselves. You feel me? I think um, me, No Name, Saba, Pivot, that whole crew, you know, I was around Treated Crew at the time, Lon and um, them people uh, with Via Rosa and The Mind, and that was just, it was there was a lot of talent in Chicago, you know. Um, still is, but there was just a lot of talent that was around each other at that time. Vic, Super, Chance. There yeah. was a time when everybody was working out of Music Garage. Like yeah. uh, I saw DJ Ken and uh, Fredo, rest in peace, and and Chief Keeping them would be pulling up to Music Garage. Vic had a spot in Music Garage. Jungle Boys on the fifth floor. Super on the fourth floor. Me Slime and One One Nine is on the fourth floor. It was just Everybody was around each other. Everybody was cooking up. Everybody knew that there was an ascension about to happen, and and they were just honing their craft. Um, I think shortly even before that, when Chance blew up, and it kind of like was a signal to everybody else in the city. Before that, you got everybody going to the same open mics. You got everybody going to Lyricist Loft at the the library. You got everybody going to uh, YCA up north. You got you know it was just a creative time where everybody was closer to each other as far as proximity. So I think it allowed us to sharpen our our, yeah. our swords uh, against each other, with yeah. each other, uh, a lot easier than what it takes now that we're all successful and separated all over the country. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So um, to look back at that is like, it's cool, you know, but I don't, It just is yeah. to me. It's not something that I think on like, oh man, that was so special. It's just like, yeah. well, that's what it was. Like, yeah, yeah. It's not, it wasn't necessarily special. We're just all super talented and mm-hmm. that's fire. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. but to me, it's just, it happened. It was, it, that was that time. That's yeah. what it's like. Um, and to look at it today is crazy, but just confirmation, you know, to see everybody getting it in their own right, everybody sustained, you know, uh, a lot of people get in this, have some success, and then like completely fall off. You know, yeah. get in this, have some success, and then you have to ask, what are they doing? What are they doing? And you know, I know people still ask what Mick Jenkins doing, but when you go look, there's something for you to find. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I think sometimes there's not anything for you to find. I can name a few people who, you know, 
was with us mm. and they not no more. You know what I'm saying? Like you there you're not gonna find no new music from them yeah. for the last five years. You're not gonna da 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 da. I'll still see that dude and dap him up and show him hella love. That's that's the homie, but you know, a lot of people fall by the wayside. So to still see so many of us successful and putting out quality music and projects and getting brand deals and yeah. doing this and that, you know, it's it's dope, but it's also like we all knew each other had that ability yeah. ten years ago. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So it's not surprising at all. It's just yeah. it's just fire that everybody's still cooking. All right. So I think with that thought in mind, right? We talked about this a bit off camera, but like 2024 marks 10 years since you dropped the waters. Mm -hmm. um, looking back at that time period and like what the last 10 years have been, like what does that project mean to you a decade later? Not as much as people think it should. It's just where I started. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a special place for that. It's the it's the one that broke me. It's the one that gave me national attention. Um, but uh, it's actually it's also a source of frustration for me because mm -hmm. people think it's the best, mm -hmm. and it's just like in no way, shape, or form the best thing I've ever done at all. Like mm -hmm. at all. Like yeah. I don't think it's my best rapping. Mm -hmm. Certainly wasn't our best production. Most of those beats we took off YouTube. Like, really? Most of those beats. We're not like a hundred percent on God production. Like, there's three beats that yeah. we're only getting five percent on Jeez. because we didn't do anything to yeah. them. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, jazz <laughs> is Yale Nyem's toxic cover. Like, we added hi hats. You know, Healer is a song that like eight people have used. Like, for uh, Fabulous has used that beat. Uh, Doja Cat's used that beat. Like, multiple people have used that beat. Like, mm. uh, by Hippie Koala. Mm. Uh, we only get 5% of that because we didn't do anything to it. Mm -hmm. So it's just like these these things are the reasons why Waters could never be my best project. Yeah. We did it in the term, we, were, we didn't know what we were doing. You know yeah. what I'm saying? We were, it was early. Uh, I had a concept. I think it's dope. I think it's mm -hmm. great. But even the concept is very surface level to me. Like, water is truth. What, what, what ended up happening is people would take that metaphor and say, well, whatever my truth is, mm -hmm. that's water. Like, drink more water. And it's yeah. just like, well, no, that's not what I'm saying, yeah. like at all. But that helped me learn like, when you have a concept that everybody feels like they could mold it to their situation, that's really what you want. Mm -hmm. Like, then people take that and run with it, yeah. right? Like, bunch of people, oh yeah, this means this. And it's like, but you're saying it means yeah. something for you and he's yeah. saying it means something for him. It's just mm -hmm. like, that's actually great. Yeah. Like, because yeah. people will then continue to take this thing and give it meaning, give it meaning, give it meaning, yeah. versus you being very specific mm. and they find it harder to apply it to themselves personally. Mm -hmm. You feel me? That was a source of frustration for me. It's just like, mm. I'm watching people take the waters and make it mean shit that I never intended for it to mean. You know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. All that did was make me get more specific on my following project. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, if I'm general, people are gonna misunderstand what I actually mean. Whereas five, six years later, I'm like, actually, it was great that people were misunderstanding yeah. what I mean. I have to stop. I can't control how you interpret the music once I let it go. Mm -hmm. So if I've done something that allows a thousand people to interpret it a thousand different ways, that's actually more positive mm -hmm. than I thought previously. Yeah. But yeah, man, all in all, the waters is just, it was my first, you know? I. Mm -hmm my first big project um i don't at all think it's anywhere near my best so with that in mind uh what out of your catalog what project is your personal favorite my favorite would be pieces of a man mm -hmm. um yeah that's my favorite i think favorite and best are are different things though but that's my favorite one for sure what do you think's the best I think the best changes, I, the best would be Elephant in a Room or Patience to me, mm -hmm. one of the two. I think the rapping, the production, the concept, top to bottom, um, and then how we express that through the videos, mm -hmm. I think all of that as a full body of work is what you would judge to say best or not. Yeah. I think some of my best rapping is on the Patience. I think some of my best rapping is on Elephant in the Room. Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of the patience, you dropped that project back in August. Yeah. Um, what was the creation process of that project like? Uh, very different from all my other processes. I think I usually just choose a concept and then try to apply, make sure I keep the concept in my mind as I make music for the following months. Mm -hmm. um, in this situation, I didn't have a concept at all. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I'm just gonna make music that I like. Um, 
And then once we had a budget for a project, I chose, I like uh, consolidated and went from 40 to 29, from 29 to 19, from 19 to 11. And then I couldn't, I couldn't go any smaller. So yeah. that's a patient came out with 11, 10 songs. Yeah. So on the outro on MOP, you said that you feel like you're stepping into like uh, a new kind of agency over like your creativity, your artistry. Yeah. Um, can you expound on that thought? Um, I think when people get into this industry, well, I won't say people. When I got into this industry, there was just a lot I didn't know, even though there was a lot I did know. Yeah. Um, and I think it just takes time to optimize how to run your business in this world for you. I think there's a lot of frameworks uh, that sh that have been successful that don't have anything to do with you. Um, and you adopt those frameworks in this business and you assume that they'll be profitable for you. Uh, I've just, I've done that two or three different times and over the years I've learned that, oh, I don't have to adopt any of these frameworks. I can create my own. Um, I think the music business is definitely an industry where people say, well, it's done this way. Well, it's done this way. Well, it's done this way a lot, you know? And I just learned it don't have to be. And I think you have to learn you know, you have to learn that things don't have to be the way that they always are. Um, I think that takes trying different things, making mistakes, you know, trying new things. Some some of the things working, some of the things not working. Um, but just forcing yourself to not be limited to what has always been done. Um, and I think there is a lot of, well, this is the way we do things in the business side of music. Uh, <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm in patience. I signed a one project deal we were just talking about a new deal for a new project. And I literally was like, the new deal isn't gonna come from any existing framework that already exists in the mm -hmm. industry because yeah. any existing framework that already exists in the industry is not working for me. Mm -hmm. like, it is that, it's for y'all, mm -hmm. it's not for me. Um, and it took me to, to sign a shitty ass deal, yeah. go through the ups and downs of that, and then to come into a great situation i can't complain about anything that my label has done for the patients they've gone above and beyond wouldn't do it again as it's currently constructed mm. it's 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 not even the label it's mm. not it is this it's the system mm. it's the framework of how we build out deals yeah. you know what i'm saying i take let's just do a figurative number let's say i take 354 project 350,000 there's a huge part of that let's say 150 is uh, marketing, mm -hmm. let's say the rest was at 175, 175. So two, 200, the other 200 is for recording budget. Mm -hmm. Let's say 50 of that is for features. Mm -hmm. And then the other 50 is for recording, producers, yeah. samples, all that other shit. What part of that does my manager get paid from? 20%. Where he get his 20% from? From your cut. I don't got a cut. Mm -hmm. I just signed a deal to make an album. They just gave me 350 to make the album. Mm -hmm. 150 is going to marketing. I can't take money for there for me. 200 is going to the recording. Mm. If I actually spend the 200 on the recording, mm -hmm. where's my cut? Mm. I don't have a cut. Yep. I spent all the money where it was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Where does my manager get his cut? Mm. He don't have a cut. He can just cut off profit. Yep. We haven't made any profit yet. Mm. We won't make no profit for a year from now. When I, when, I, when the album recoups. Yeah. By the time the album recoups, I'm pushing a different album. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, where, what do we do? We yeah. take we take that 350, give my manager his cut. Mm. Give my business manager his cut. Mm. Now I've just taken money out of a loan mm -hmm. to pay people who do not have to pay it back. But if I don't pay them out of that loan, they won't get paid. Yeah. That, right, I don't, I could go a lot deeper. Yeah. That's the surface. Yeah. Simply is not built for me to even pay my team. Yeah, absolutely without having to take away money from what the I'm supposed art. to be using it to create the art. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. simply, I don't even have to get deeper than that. The framework of how we do things is not built for us. Mm. It's not built for us to win. Mm. That's, right. a, that's an interesting thought. Have, have you, and obviously there's no like clear cut answer. Have you thought like, is there a certain framework framework that you think doesn't exist yet that could work for this or? Yeah, I think, I even think there's frameworks that exist. That's mm -hmm. just like, why would you be telling everybody that you could? Yeah. The labels are hell bent on holding on to the way they've been doing things. Mm -hmm. And if not the way they've been doing things, the way they've been in power for sure. Yeah. And so 
Yeah, if they are doing that, they're not telling everybody. That's true. <laughs> have, uh, have you seen it improve in your time since like your first label, label deal to now? Seen what improve? Just like, I guess the the framework or like... No. Um, no? No. no. Oh, that's something that you would have to see across the board to yeah. say that it's improved. Yeah. Like one person, you know, I know for a fact that Tyler has an amazing deal. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like... Tyler having an amazing deal doesn't change the framework for the industry yeah, at all right. or yeah. anybody else. It's, yeah. That's for him. You feel me? Like, mm -hmm. and so, no, nah, I haven't seen a change. Just, you would see a change with uh, the way that new artists, you would look at new artists, like, right? Well, we're, we're looking for change. Let's look at all the people who are getting signed, right? Mm -hmm. Who's been signed in the last three years? Yeah. What kind of deals are we talking? No, yeah. no, we haven't seen a change. Yeah. Not at all. I mean, even just streaming alone, like, it didn't change. It got worse. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like the the nature of how we sell music, like even that, like I'm say I say what I just told you to my manager. He's like, well, we make our money through sales and merch. I'm like, through a uh, tour and merch. Tour too. Yeah. I was like, but we sell music. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking about touring and merch right mm -hmm. now. I'm talking about selling my music. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? So nah, I think streams make it harder mm -hmm. for a deal. That's what I also I'm I'm just being open. I'm re trying to rework the deal with my label, not rework, but trying to come up with a new one. And it's just like yeah. the way that streams are set up is why we don't make no money. Is yeah. why it takes so long to recoup. <clears throat> People, you understand what I'm saying? Wouldn't take so long to recoup if it took if it wasn't 1,500 streams for an album sale. You mm -hmm. feel me? Like yeah. that's why it takes so long. To, and even still, off the patience, I'm close to halfway recoup. Yeah, it's only been out for six months. Yeah. yeah. So where would I be if? I was actually getting what it was worth yeah. and not 1500 streams per sale. Yeah. I feel like the average music listener too will look at streams and see like millions of streams or in our case, like YouTube videos and see yeah. like millions of views. And they assume it's just like, it equates to millions of dollars, but it's really far, far, far from that. Um, Insane. People far. think we go crazy off YouTube. We really make nothing off nothing. of YouTube. Um, nothing. Yeah. Just had a conversation. We just spent five figures on a YouTube video mm -hmm. that did 1.5 million. Not worth it. Mm, yeah. yeah. Not worth it. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> not, great video, great yeah. views. Yeah. But a million well, five but, is yeah. not enough to be spending more than, you know, up like considerably more than ten thousand yeah. dollars. No, bro. It's yeah, not yeah. it's not worth it. Like so yeah, it's 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 stuff like that that I see getting worse and not better. And so the framework of your deal, because these are the metrics by which they'll be judged, right? Your streams, your YouTube numbers, your, you know, when they when when you tell a label, I want a million dollars for this project, mm. that's what they're gonna put that million up against. So it's like, all right, let's see if you worth it. You yeah. feel me? Like, and that because that's how we even start to have a conversation. No, mm. I don't see it getting better because yeah. it this is the system that it's built on. It mm. can't get better in this way. So tonight you are beginning your thank you for waiting tour in Chicago. How are you feeling going into tour? And then after that, uh, how did you go about choosing to bring Toby on the road with you? Uh, I usually don't choose mm -hmm. the openers. Um, I just talk with uh, my booking agents, mm -hmm. um, CAA. Um, usually we just be a agree on people, but they usually bring me a list of people, yeah. uh, tell me who they would like. To. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh yeah, I fuck with that person, yeah. yeah. That's what happened here, they just brought me Toby and I'm like, oh yeah, dope, yeah. we done work together before. Yeah. Um, he was the first person I worked with when I got to LA, just mm. off connections, you know. Um, so that's that was easy, um, they, they they suggested him, he, he has a draw, I fuck with him, that's yep. easy. Um, but uh, I'm just happy to be touring. Yeah. You know, we haven't got back on the road since COVID. Um, we we were in the middle of a tour when COVID hit, so uh, haven't performed, haven't been on the road since then. So mm. just happy to get back in front of the fans. Um, we were saying off record, you know, this is work. Yeah. This is the biggest work part of what I do. Um, studio is work, videos are work, mm. photo shoots are work, but that shit is actually very easy to do and yeah. fun a lot of the time. This is work. You yeah. know, Flying and driving and taking trains around the country, getting in, tired, doing interviews, mm -hmm. <laughs> doing photo shoots, meeting with fans. Yeah. I, the best part of tour is being on stage, and that only happens for an hour a day. Yeah. So the other 18 hours that we're doing shit is not, it's not fun. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's, but it's work. It's what yeah. it takes. So that's how I see it. How would you describe the differences between touring overseas and here in the States? The biggest difference with shows overseas in the States to me is just people's inhibitions. I think uh, 
it's been my experience that overseas, those audiences just give me what they got, right? They give me how they feel and they give me how they receive the music. In America, especially because I'm American and I know what what I'm looking at, people be trying to be too cool. People don't, that's, that's usually what I see. Like people be trying to be too cool. You know what I'm saying? Like people don't give you their all for whatever reasons. You know what I'm saying? It might be because who's behind them or who's yeah. in front of them or how many people are in here versus, I, I, there'd be a lot of different reasons that I assume or that I can notice. And simply put, when I'm overseas, I don't really see any of that at all. Like, yeah. Even if I'm wrong about what I assumed, right? I just don't feel, see the same type of behavior or energy when I'm overseas. Like they just give me what they got. Yeah. And it's usually, you know, some of my latest shows. I would say mm. outside of Chicago, New York, and LA, my best shows are always overseas. Mm. Right? And even New York and LA is just like very specific crowds. Don't know what New York crowd you're gonna get. Don't yeah. know what LA crowd you're gonna get. Like yeah. you could get an LA crowd. I have had LA crowds that are going stupid. I've had LA crowds that are all being way too cool. Mm. I've had New York crowds that are going crazy. I've had New York crowds that are just staring up at me. You mm -hmm. feel me? Like so. Yeah. Um, but just again, those are just polarizing cities where mm -hmm. you can have crazy crowds or not. Chicago's always lit. Yeah. But I will always most of my best shows are overseas. Mm. I'm sure my best show ever was in Fraunfeld, Germany. Mm. It went absolutely nuts. Mm. <laughs> I it was like I was a rock star for real. Yeah. The way they were moshing and I was just like, bro, I don't even make this kind of music. Yeah. Like, yeah, like so <laughs> that was the craziest show I had. It was like twenty five hundred people. I stage dive and the crowd Lost my phone, set it on the mic. They brought my phone back up to me. It was crazy. It was the craziest yeah. show I ever did, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Very accommodating crowd. Yeah. I like that. In yeah. Germany, mm. which is just, as a black man, it's crazy. Mm. <laughs> um, so, obviously, you know, many people know you've had a ton of success in your life and career, but not many people know that you are a fantasy football champion. Mm -hmm. How does it feel? Um, I'm, I take fantasy sports very serious. Me too. Uh, Fantasy basketball specifically. Mm. Um, this is my first year playing fantasy football, and I won in a two hundred fifty dollar buy in. Buy in. Oh, that's yeah, a good. Yeah, that's yeah. a good pot. First year, so you know, shout out to Pharaoh, mm. bums. <laughs> uh, spent that money well. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I'm super into sports specifically. I'm I'm, I'm going to be more into football next year, especially because I'm into it because of yeah. fantasy, but especially basketball. You yeah. could name a name a team, and I'm probably I give you 11, 12 on the roster. Like I I watch ball heavy, so yeah. fantasy sports is my way to get in. Yeah, yeah. I can't really do the fantasy basketball because it's it's a lot of setting your lineup. It's a lot. The fantasy football I could do like it's once a week. Yeah, no, nah, basketball is a lot. Yeah, there's definitely days where I'll be like, fuck, I forgot yeah. to set my lineup. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah like. I tried it for one year, it didn't work. I'm gonna yeah. go back. You it 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 I hate it. I hate that I have to admit it, but it does require require considerably more than football. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Nah, it was fun. I saw that I saw that you won. I was like, damn, I got second place this year. One thing we both had was Kyron Williams on our teams. Dog. <laughs> I added him. Late. Because he was, added he him was off a free the, agent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Best uh, decision I made. Yeah, I uh he went to Notre Dame. I'm a huge Notre Dame fan. So word, when, word. when they would come to the city, he would pull up here all the time. I liked him in college, but when uh, he didn't get picked up to start the season, I picked yeah. him up, put him on the bench. He went stupid. Nuts. He's a top five player. Best ad I had all season. All right. Mick, last question. Where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, Probably back in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, you know, I used to have uh, this joint called We Space in Chicago where we curated just a lot of different art uh, events from small shows to uh, listening parties to exhibits for um, artists like uh, painters and mm -hmm. um, you, you know all different kinds of mediums um, and I just want to do that again yeah. on, a, on a larger scale I think uh, I get frustrated when I look around Chicago especially when I come back here sometimes and I be looking for something to do um, and it's not like it used to be when I was a kid when I was 16 17 wishing I was 18 and wishing I was 21 to go do all the cool stuff that I saw happening. Uh, I just realized like I'm the person who should be doing that, yeah. right? Like the people who were probably doing that when I was 16 and 17, wishing I was 21 mm -hmm. were probably 
30, 31, 32, 35. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just like, yeah, nigga, like you're you're a you're a uh you're a player in the city, like me. Like I'm you know, I hate I'm somebody mm-hmm. type shit. Yeah. Um I have the means, I have the connections, mm-hmm. I have the mind, like the curative mind, right? Like I don't wanna just do something. Like I got I know like dope shit to do, you know what I'm saying? I got no know how to create a dope vibe. Me and my wife have thrown more than a few events, especially with WeSpace. Um, that's been fun, you know what I'm saying? And so just contributing to the culture in Chicago in that way, yeah. um, I, 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 I'm I, like hell bent on doing, you yeah. know? Um, I think Chicago is a very dope city and it could be doper mm-hmm. if we did more stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I think people who come here and spend time here, um, there is a lack of a certain type of culture that is easier to find in other places. And I find that people who do have that experience in Chicago talk about how you need to know somebody from Chicago to find that experience, right? I just want to be able to grow that type of culture in Chicago. Um, I feel like a lot of times, the only place we really go collectively, like everybody, oh oh yeah, like it's Soho House. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot of other places where people can just go post up, kick it, drink, work on their laptops, you know what I'm saying? And find a myriad of vibes here, depending on the night, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Besides Soho House, yeah. not to say that they don't exist, but I want to come back and be a part of creating that culture and contributing mm-hmm. to that culture. Um, making more, more music, making albums. Um, I'd hopefully I'll have my own studio where I'm working out of that and allowing people to rent rooms out of that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, 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 turning up the infrastructure of my business, for real, for real. Um, a lot of what I do and a lot of what I have is is intangible, and I want to brick and mortar what I'm doing, you know, yeah. have a home base, um, and then and then take that as far as it can go. No feet going up, fiends going up, we pulling up, we throwing up gang signs, trees going up and flames find us a